Luigi has touched on this already. I just want to start off by uh, introducing the truncated disk model. So if you look at the spectrum of a black hole binary on different days, uh, you see different things. Okay, so the, the red spectrum on the left is a typical soft state spectrum, and the, the spectrum um, is quite easy to explain or quite well understood as a Shakura Sunyai of accretion disk over here extending down uh, to the innermost stable circular orbit. Um, but then if you look at the same object on a different day, you see it's dominated by a hard power law uh, and has uh, uh, reflection features such as uh, ion chi alpha line. Um, and in order to explain that, you need to have some kind of compensation. Uh, and it's not exactly clear where the electrons are that do the compensation, but in the truncated disk model, uh, the assumption is that inside of some truncation radius, um, the, the thin Shakura Sunyaya disk um, evaporates into some um, hot plasma where uh, the hot electrons inside the, this inner flow, they uh, come to up scatter photons from the disk and also um, uh, self-produced photons uh, from, synchrotron self, uh, from uh, cyclosynchrotron processes to make this power law with a high energy cutoff. And then you, you get reflection features when photons from the, the inner regions, from this inner flow, um, reflect off the outer disk. And then in principle, you can explain the, the evolution in spectra just by changing the truncation radius. So if the truncation radius moves in, then there's a greater luminosity of C photons uh, from the disk incident on the inner flow, and that cools the flow, so you get this spectrum that, that still has a power law, but it's a softer power law, and also you see more direct disk emission. So, so that's variability on uh, timescales of weeks, but this, this is variability on a timescale of 200 seconds, and this is pretty much exactly the same thing that, that Chris was showing earlier. Uh, these are both from XTJ1550, but the the red points are in the soft state and the blue points are in the hard state. And you automatically see that uh, the hard state is far more variable than the soft state. But this noise is uh, stochastic, so you can't see an awful lot just by looking in the time domain. You're much better off uh, making a power spectrum, so taking the modulus squared of the Fourier transform and uh, averaging it over the whole observation. And if you do that for that hard state observation, this is what you get. So. Uh, in units of frequency times power, which shows fractional variability squared on the y-axis uh, for each uh, Fourier frequency on the x-axis, you see you get this um, uh, broadband continuum noise, which is interesting in itself, but what, what is probably even more interesting are the quasi-periodic oscillations. So these, these peaks here, well this is one quasi-periodic oscillation, because this is the fundamental this is the first, this is the second harmonic of that fundamental, and then this is a third harmonic as well. Um, and as, as you expect, as the spectrum is getting softer, so you expect the truncation radius to be moving in, you see that the, the QPO frequency increases. So we want to explain that in the context of the truncated disk model, because we like that because it can explain the spectra. So the idea is that this this QPO, and this is the, the low frequency QPO, or the, the type C low frequency QPO uh, uh, for, for the experts, uh, the idea is that this is uh, a signature of frame dragging. So um, a lot of people have talked about this already, so I'll keep it brief, but if you have the, the artist's impression of the black hole in the middle there, if, that is, if that's spinning, um, then it should drag space-time with it. So if if a test mass tries to orbit around this black hole in a gravitationally bound orbit, um, in, and its plane, uh, its orbital plane is misaligned with the spin plane of the black hole like this, then its orbit will process. And this is called Lenz-Hattering precession after the, the authors that originally derived it in 1918. Uh, and basically in, in the, the weak field limit that uh, lens um derived it in, the, the precession frequency is proportional to r to the minus three. So the closer in the test mass is, the faster it wants to process. But we're not considering uh, a test mass. We're thinking about an accretion disk and this, this inner flow, this inner hot plasma. So there's not just gravity happening. There's not just the metric. There's also other physics. So, so what happens? Because the inner regions are trying to process faster than the outer regions. So the question is, is that allowed to happen 
or does the extra physics, does the communication between different kind of regions of the disk prevent that from happening? As when you do the calculation for a, for a thin disk, which is uh, on the right here, this is the Bardeen Patterson effect. So um, the black hole spin axis in, in, this, in both of these pictures is uh, pointing vertically upwards, and the binary partner is off in that direction. So, there, so there's a misalignment. Uh, and because the, the warps that are created by this kind of uh, differential procession, or, or the particles wanting to process differentially, uh, because it's communicated in this case by viscosity, which is slow, uh, you end up with a stationary configuration. And, and, and what Bardeen and Pedersen found, and, and authors after them, uh, was that you end up with the inner regions aligning with the black hole, and the outer regions aligning uh, with the binary partner, and then there's some kind of transition radius, which is, which is a little bit uncertain. Um, but that's not at all the case uh, for uh, this kind of hot fluffy flow scenario, because that is coupled by uh, pressure waves rather than viscosity, which are fast. So this is a simulation by uh, Christopher Gill and co-authors. Uh, so again, the, the black hole spin axis is pointing vertically up. They, th they thread an uh, analytic solution with magnetic fields and let it evolve. And they find that the whole thing can process as a solid body. So there's still, there's still a differential nearly capillarian rotation, but every region of the flow has the same uh, procession frequency. And the reason that can happen is because these warps that are communicated, are communicated quickly by, by pressure waves. Um, so that can happen quickly enough for every ring in the flow to decide on an average uh, procession frequency. And it turns out that, that that average is a surface density weighted average. So all you need to do in order to calculate uh, the procession frequency of this whole thing, processing as a solid body, uh, is the, the lens tiering formula and the surface density profile in the flow. So bringing those two ideas together, if the bardeen petterson transition radius is small, this outer disk in a truncated disk scenario should align with the binary partner, um, and then, then it's feeding the inner flow, which is shown in black here, it's, it's feeding the, the inner flow uh, in a way that's misaligned with the black hole spin axis, and it should be able to process like this. So this is for a very high inclination angle, 80 degree inclination angle uh, to the disk, uh, so you'll see a really strong modulation um, of this procession here, and see a very strong PPO. Whereas if it's from a slightly lower inclination, you'll see a slightly, uh, a slightly lower amplitude of your QPO, and that's, this is what the calculation gives, but, but, it, but it's obvious. Um, and and that's, exact, that's exactly what you see, actually. So the QPO amplitude does depend on inclination angle. So this is a plot from uh, Schnittman, Hohmann, and Miller, 2006. And they, they just try and take some comparable uh, QPOs from different sources, uh, measure the fractional RMS, uh, in the QPO and plot it against binary inclination angle and they find quite a strong dependence and there's, there's uh, some other work that's uh, not quite yet uh, published which is even more convincing than this um, by um, Lucy Hyam co-authors uh, but yeah I believe that the QPO amplitude definitely depends on inclination angle um, and then also another nice thing is uh, that the, the energy spectrum of the QPO matches with this uh, processing flow scenario so if you look in the top here, this is from Zobolewska and uh, Zitsky, 2006. And uh, on the top we have the mean spectrum, and that's fit with a, a disk plus Comptonization. But if you take only, only the, the spectrum that's varying on the QPO frequencies, this is the frequency resolved spectrum of the QPO, you see you do get Comptonization, but you don't get a disk, which is exactly what you expect to see um, if, it's a, if it's from a processing flow. But then the, the kind of big first question, the, the qualifying round for, for this model, is what do the frequencies do? So I said a few slides ago that all you need to do in order to calculate the frequency is have the surface density profile. So on the left here, this is surface density on the y-axis and radius on the x-axis. Uh, and we want to match the observed range of QPO frequencies in, in black hole binaries. Uh, so over the right here, the, the y-axis is frequency, and it's going between uh, 0.1 and 10 hertz, which is what you always see, this, this range of frequencies that you tend to get in black holes. And on the y-axis here, on the x-axis, sorry, 
is the uh, truncation radius, which I've got going from about uh, 50 gravitational radii out here, which is kind of what you expect from spectral fitting. So if you take the surface density profile you get from the, the Fregill simulations and uh, use some analytical approximations to A, understand um, why it looks like that and also to be able to parameterize it, you can do that for different spins and, and you get this result, this really nice result that for a range of spins um, and, and for, the, for the reasonable range of truncation radii you expect, it, it all fits nicely inside of this of this range. So that's all very nice, but it's, it, it's certainly not a smoking gun. It's circumstantial evidence at best. And we want smoking gun evidence. Right? And, and what, what can provide that, I think, is uh, Doppler tomography. So this is another very familiar concept. That, uh, so we get reflection when the photons from this flow reflect from the outer disk. And if you were just going to have a, a, a delta function iron line in the rest frame, that's not what you'd see, because um, the emission that's coming from the approaching region of the disk is seen to be uh, blue shifted by Doppler effect and also uh, boosted due to time dilation. And the emission that's coming from the receding side uh, is seen to be red shifted due to Doppler effects. And then everything is also gravitationally redshifted as well. So you end up with this, um, you end up with this characteristic iron line profile uh, that we've heard a lot about already. Uh, but this, is, this was calculated assuming um, axisymmetric uh, illumination profile of the, of the disk, which isn't the case in terms of this model, because this inner flow, this inner illuminating flow is processing. Uh, so the, the colors here are, are telling you about uh, redshift. Uh, so the, the blue bit is blue shifted, so it's coming towards us. And the, the red bit is uh, red shifted, so it's coming, going away from us. And then the contours are telling us about the, the uh, illumination of the disk by the inner flow. So you can see that the, uh, the patch of the disk preferentially illuminated by the flow is rotating as the um, as the flow processes. And that's significant because when you illuminate the, when you preferentially illuminate the approaching side of the disk, you get very strong um, blue shift and boosting in your iron line. And when you preferentially illuminate the receding side, you get very strong red shift. So you end up with this kind of characteristic rocking of the iron line on the QBO frequency. Now if you just see something like this, I would argue this is far more than circumstantial evidence. This is smoking gun evidence that you're looking at some kind of uh, procession in the inner regions. Um, so if you want to go and test whether you can actually see this, you need to have a more realistic spectral model than, um, than a, a delta function. You, you want to put in a, a, con a continuum and also a, a realistic reflection uh, rest frame spectrum. So here, this is, this is from Ingram and Doe in 2012, where I, I hadn't yet had the, the fancy light bending. So this is pretty much exactly the same, uh, uh, but only it has straight photon paths. Uh, but the, the advantage of this is uh, uh, we had uh, a proper spectral model. So the, the blue line on the right is uh, just NTH comp for the, for the Comptonization, and it's self-consistently going up and down um, be, because of this procession. And then the green line is... Um, uh, RFX conf, it's the reflection model, uh, with some ionization, so there's intrinsic width to the line as well. Uh, but you see that this thing still, it still rocks. And what happens is the, the, the blue wing is boosted during the QPO rise, and the, the red wing is boosted during the QPO fall. And the reason for that is, because if you imagine this thing as like a lighthouse, okay, so when the lighthouse faces you, that's the maximum. When it faces away from you, that's the QPO trough. So it has to come towards you in order to face you. So it has to illuminate the approaching region and get the blue shift before it sees you. So you're always going to get the blue shift on the rising part and the red shift on the falling part. So you can try and just uh, do uh, crude phase resolved spectroscopy by trying to bin this thing into these four phases, a rising, a maximum, a falling, and a minimum phase.
And when, when you do that for the model, this is what you get. This is a ratio to a power law. And you get, so the, the green line is obviously the, the QPO trough. The, the black line is obviously the QPO uh, uh, peak. And then the, the blue line here is the rising phase and the red line is the falling phase. So you see this effect, it's, it's much more subtle, of course, than if you just had a delta function, but it's still, for reasonable parameters, you should definitely be able to see this if you have a good enough instrument. So what instruments can we see it with, and should we already have seen it with RSTE? So if you simulate this uh, for a five kilosecond exposure with, with uh, RXTE, um, well, that's, that's a disaster, you can't see that. Um, and this is a, a kind of reasonable, um, this is a reasonable exposure, five kiloseconds is probably uh, longer than the average observation in uh, the RXTE archive. And also, this, this is assuming five PCUs uh, being switched on, and also uh, full standard two uh, energy uh, resolution. So it, it may be difficult to, to see this exact effect with, with RXTE, um, but what about XMN? XMN? So this is the epic PN in timing mode for a five kilosecond exposure. And you see, maybe you're doing a little bit better, but I've had to really heavily bin here to get it looking like anything other than uh, noise. Uh, so basically you need more than five kiloseconds, but because XMN's still in the sky and still, still working, you just propose for more time. So what about 100 kiloseconds? And you can actually start to start to see this. You can start to see that there is a difference between the two lines and start to resolve this uh, effect uh, with the epic PN. And actually, I've got a 200 kilosecond uh, TOO just waiting for the next black hole to go off. Uh, so maybe we'll be able to kind of discover this effect happening uh, when, when the right black hole goes off and does the right thing and behaves properly, because you know they always, uh, they always behave as they're meant to. Um, but really, this is, this is for kind of discovery, but what you really want to do is, is measure things. Learn about, um, learn about the environment, learn about uh, the accretion flow and the geometry, and, and measure things like the inclination angle. Uh, and to do that, you, you need a bigger telescope. And if you, if you had a uh, loft, in five kiloseconds, this is what you could get. This is five kiloseconds. It's insanely good. So if you had 100 kiloseconds, you could get this kind of quality for 80 phase bins. Yeah, so you could, you could just do one long observation, split everything up into like 100 phase bins, and see in, in excruciating detail how the iron line would change, and be able to map uh, everything. Um, and then, yeah, so this is, um, so that was all for the hard state for a, for a large truncation radius of uh, 60 RG, and it was an inclination angle of uh, 60 degrees. Uh, but, but things are different for the, for the intermediate state. If you did exactly the same thing um, for a truncation radius of 7 RG, then it's a little bit different. So here I've just plotted the rise spectrum divided by the fall spectrum. So it's just the blue lines, the, the blue points divided by the red points. And this is now for a 10 kilosecond exposure because it, it looks so nice. Um, and you see that you can immediately see that the, the truncation radius is different between these two because this has this wiggle here. And, and the intermediate state doesn't have a wiggle. And the reason for this um, is because of gravitational redshift. So gravitational redshift isn't important for the example on the left because we're, we're so far out, whereas it is important for the example uh, on the right because we're down at, at, at 7 RG for the inner disk edge. Um, so if you imagine the kind of the, the red wing from the inner, the very inner regions of the disk, that's, that's, uh, the, the shape of that is dominated more by gravitational redshift than by the Doppler effects. And they, that doesn't change uh, with, with QPO phase. So you, you get that you don't get this, um, this little dip here, but you still get a huge, you still get a huge peak. Um, so, so that's nice. You can just look at the thing and say whether you've got a big truncation radius or a small truncation radius. But what you really want to do is uh, get some numbers out of it. So this is what, I, I had this and I said, oh, this is fantastic, you know, let's put it in the Loft Yellow book. And, and uh, Luigi and McKeel said, well, no, you need to get some numbers out of this. So, uh, but in order to get numbers out of it, it's not so simple because you need to fit. Um, and this is, a, this is a kind of frame from the animation I showed you earlier. And so the luminosity or the, the surface flux across every pixel on this disk, uh, every patch of this disk, is calculated by integrating over every patch of the flow, 
Um, and then you do that for every dispatch, for every um, procession angle. So that takes ages. So you can't, you can't fit this thing. Uh, so you've got to find some way to, to make it faster. So but this um, illumination pattern here, it looks fairly simple. You know, it's just some, it's just some circles and it changes with, uh, with procession phase. So what it is, I, I just, um, yeah, and you, and you know where this is going to peak as well. You know if, if the flow is kind of tilted in one way, the, the peak of this illumination pattern is going to be at some angle. So you can set that to phi equals zero and then just define an analytic function. So this is the, the intensity uh, across the surface of a given point of the disk uh, defined by r and phi. And then it's just a power law in r, which is um, uh, routinely done for, for models like Diskline. Uh, but then it has this extra thing where you've got uh, a Gaussian uh, as a function of phi, and then you also have a, have a constant there as well. And as, as things process, the phi equals zero point changes, so this illumination pattern moves around. And you can see this really captures the important aspects of the, uh, the illumination pattern that you calculate properly, but only this is done in a fraction of a second. So this is back to the uh, simulated observations. And then when you, when you go and fit this kind of analytical model retrospectively, uh, you get really nice constraints on the, the radius and the, and the inclination angle. There's a few systematic differences, but that's because the, the model that, that I fit it with isn't exactly what came out, but you still get, you still get very, very close, um, which is really, really encouraging. And you get these nice constraints on the truncation radius and uh, on the inclination angle. So in conclusion, uh, I probably have a bit more time, actually. I'll just take my time over the conclusions. <laughs> in conclusion, the, the, the key PO properties uh, in, in black holes uh, seem to be consistent with uh, a relativistic nodal procession or, or lensatering procession. It's not necessarily the case in, in the neutron stars, as, as uh, Diego Altamirano hinted to the other day. There's, there's a problem with uh, Tosan 5 X2, which just spins, uh, spins too damn slowly to, uh, to, to be lensatering procession. But in the, in, the, in the black holes, it seems to work uh, quite nicely. Um, but we need a, a smoking gun. We need to like, do something more detailed to really understand what's going on and differentiate between different models. And the precession model predicts that the iron line should rock between red and blue shift in the QPO frequency. So if we can phase resolve the QPO, uh, then maybe we have a chance of being able to, to prove that we really are seeing uh, precession. Uh, we may be able to discover this with long observations using uh, XMM, or I also haven't mentioned uh, uh, New Star, you could probably do this, and, uh, and Astro H as well. Uh, but if you want to really study this and, and measure parameters, you, you need loft. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.